Hello and welcome to The Situation Report today. Very glad to have you joining me. This is the show where we do our very best to give you the information and perspectives you need to navigate an ever-changing culture. My name is Jeremy Stolnecker. I am your host. And today we are discussing a topic that is very important to me, should be very important to you. And we have a great guest on to help us break down this issue. Today we're going to be talking about the conflict so-called, between faith and science. We're going to be talking about intelligent design, creationism, uh, versus, if you will, evolution. This is not a debate that we're having today. But how can we look at this issue? We, in our country, used to accept, even though science may be something that was hard for a lot of us to grasp, we accepted the idea, at least, the idea of God of a creator, of an intelligent designer. Now, how all of that worked? Was it a big bang? Uh, was it a theistic type of evolution directed by God, but evolutionary? Is the earth old? Is it young? We would argue about some of those things, but did not outright reject <laughs> uh, the idea or the understanding of God. And yet today, we have come to the conclusion, because we've been pushed into it, that faith and science should not mix. If you believe in God, you believe in a creator, an intelligent design that is personal, that falls into the faith realm, but that that should not spill over into the realm of science. And today's guest, uh, who I'm so grateful we could get him on today, uh, speaks directly to this. He's written about this. He teaches on this. Uh, this is what he's given his life to. Very gra uh, grateful to have on with us today, Dr. Gordon Wilson. Dr. Wilson is currently a senior fellow of natural history at New St. Andrews College in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, before going to New St. Andrews, he was a faculty member at Liberty University. He published his dissertation research on the reproductive ecology of the eastern box turtle in southeastern uh, uh, in southeastern naturalist and the herpetological bulletin. These are all words that I struggle with because I'm not smart. Thankfully, he is, and he breaks this down. Uh, he writes on natural history. Um, he, he's written a biology textbook called The Riot and the Dance. He wrote another book not too long ago, A Different Shade of Green, A Biblical Approach to Environmentalism and the Dominion Mandate. Today's conversation, I would like for you to view as a starting point, uh, as an opportunity for you to think about these things, to get some basic information. He outlines some uh, just basic truths you can hang on to, and then to begin to research yourself. We spend uh, several minutes at the end of this conversation uh, just going through some resources. Dr. Wilson uh, breaks down here a few different resources you can look at for different areas. Very, very grateful to have him on to be able to have this conversation with Dr. Gordon Wilson. Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for joining me today. Looking forward to this conversation. Yes, I am too. Thanks for having me. I am. Uh, I, I mentioned before we started, I, I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite a while. I think this is such an important topic and one that, frankly, uh, most Christians struggle with. <laughs> I, yes. I feel like we have our personal faith convictions about creation and about intelligent design and about uh, even the topic of environmentalism and these issues but we don't always know how to leverage those in what we might call the public square with people who don't agree necessarily with our faith position. So very excited to talk about this. Uh, I would love to get some background on you. You have a very interesting kind of life journey. Um, so yeah. if you wouldn't mind, just, just kind of tell us how one gets to the place where they spend their life writing and teaching about natural history and creation and all of the things that you've been involved in. What was your path to, to where you are now? Well, obviously, I, d I didn't know my future, but as a as a kid, um, five, six years old, probably even before that, I, I just was fixated on living creatures. Um, even, even probably when I was two or three up in yeah. the Colorado mountains, my dad was up there and took the family. And I remember seeing fish swimming in this mountain pond and uh, my dad said I called them water buggies, but I was fixated. And then um, more when I was in six or so, my brothers brought home a couple box turtles from across the uh, wood, woodland across the street. And I was just fascinated. Now, the turtles weren't doing anything. They, they were yeah. 
they were shelled up. But yep. I was still just anything alive, a crab, turtle, I was just, this is great. And then I got into reptiles as a kid and then dinosaurs. A lot of kids yeah. got yeah. into a dinosaur phase. Um, I didn't know the word biology, but it was, I, I, I knew that that was my trajectory. And then when I got into high school, I wanted to take, you know, biology, advanced biology, and then it was just a logical step. So I think it was an innate, um, something that was God given. Some people are just builders or mechanical. Yeah. They yeah. just love erector sets. And I, I remember when my parents, I don't know if you've heard of erector sets. But, I, I've heard of them. I've watched old movies. They were using erector movies, sets. But, you know, that came, you know, one of my brothers got that and I just looked at it like who would want to play with that you know right um, so God really makes us all he gives us desires he gives us gifts he makes it's a good thing that we didn't all like the same thing yeah. that we don't all like the same thing so um it was innate God given desire mm. to just love love living creatures um and then you know in college I was just assume that I would just, um, early on in college, I, I realized that when I learned something cool, I wanted to teach it. Yeah. And finally yeah. dawned on me that, and I would either teach my sister or my parents. And I thought, well, I could either annoy people for the rest of my life <laughs> or get paid to do this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then I, I went, started to go towards wanting to be a high school biology teacher because I just didn't have any grandiose ideas of becoming a college professor. Mm. But then just slowly, step by step, God would God would direct my paths and then um, high school for a bit and then went back to grad school and so on. Yeah. Um, and then wound up teaching at Liberty University in the biology department. And then um, 2000, that was for about almost 12 years, and then came here in 2003, and I've been teaching at New St. Andrews College yeah. for almost 20 years. It's uh, coming up on 20 here in this summer. That's so incredible. that was my journey, um, uh, and God, I don't think he ever, rarely does he tell you, I, I don't think anybody really knew their whole course um, ahead of time. Got, of course. You know, God, God guides you and directs you at, at certain milestones along the way. And, and I love teaching biology. That's, that's my passion. What, a, what an important, uh, not just journey, but the process that brought you to a place to talk about something that is so critical. Yeah. Uh, with not only understanding, I think there are people who can do it, they understand it, but with passion. This is what you care about and what you believe uh, yes. really God and, created you to communicate. And, and grew up in a Christian home. So when I saw early on the, the conflict of creation evolution, I resolved that pretty early Yeah. Um, in seventh grade. And okay. So realized, talk about that. Talk about that for a minute, because that is, and a lot of Christians have been um, browbeaten into believing that you can, or to accepting, you can believe whatever you want to, but don't bring that into right. the public square, or that's very much an issue of faith that has nothing yeah. to do with science. Right. How yeah. did you, in seventh grade, resolve that friction between the two? Well, I knew that the faith wasn't just this abstraction like i believe in this you know that god did it and i knew that the secular narrative was that no god didn't do it um it could happen yeah. through uh, material naturalistic cause effect through millions of years of evolution i said well these these two narratives are completely incompatible mm. and many people try to make them compatible by various compromises uh, whether it's theistic evolution or whatever. And they're trying to, you know, cut with the grain of, uh, of whatever the scientific community is saying, this is true. This is, this is the way we experts have said this is true. And if you want to hang on to your faith, a lot of people feel like, well, I'm not a scientist and yep. 
the science is saying this and my faith is saying that and I need to somehow try to harmonize the two. And it's like, well, don't try because now I'm not saying that science contradicts faith. I'm saying that a certain worldviews do. Yep. But scientific um, data that's rightly interpreted through the correct worldview, um, it's not like we have to throw data out, but we do right. have to look at data and interpret the data, whether it's geology or paleontology or whatever. We need to interpret that data uh, differently according to the, the worldview. So in my science and faith, it's not like I, when I'm doing science, I have to check my um, my my faith out at the at the lab door and then when i go to church i need to check my brain out right. at the at the at the church door um they are compatible if both are rightly understood very compatible so i am um someone i, I was raised in a christian home um institute for creation research ken ham i mean those were those were our bedtime stories right and i i right. i grew up in that world um, I firmly believe in a six day creation. I, um, I hold these things to be true. I teach them to my children. We homeschool our kids. I teach them to my kids, but I am not yeah. a scientist and I don't yeah. understand the, the, the arguments, uh, on either yeah. side, really. I, I believe, um, there are some things that I could look at and say, well, because of this, you know, <laughs> he's helped me to more firmly believe uh, my kids probably have a better grasp on it than I, I do. Uh, I didn't do well in biology and chemistry <laughs> in high school. Right. Um, so I think a lot of Christian people are like me, where they would say, I believe it. I believe that Dr. Wilson can defend it, <laughs> right. but I can't. So I'm just not going to talk about it. Yeah. What do you say to people like me or to, okay. to others who would say, I, I want to talk about this with my friends. I want to uh, have these discussions but I don't have a deep PhD level understanding. How would you in, instruct someone like me to talk about this? That's a great question. And uh, the, we, I realize that not everybody can be the expert. So it's also good. It's, let's say that something, somebody asked me about the Christian faith that's in, in some theological yeah. thing that, you know, I know the basics, but I don't know. Sure the yeah. heavy theology. And so I might say, well, go talk to my brother or go, go here. And I know where to, to send them just like right. you were saying, well, Dr. Wilson can defend it, but that doesn't mean you can't know the, the basics. Right. Um, and it's, it's also nice that at the, at right, the click of a, uh, mouse, we, we have these websites that you mentioned ICR, um, you have uh, Answers in Genesis website. Yeah. Yeah. And what's really nice about it is that you can have a particular question that somebody, one of your friends posed, what about dinosaurs? Or what about yeah. radiometric yeah. dating? Or what about the yeah. blah, blah, blah? Because they're getting this narrative and you might not have at the tip of your fingers the answer, but you can either send, uh, find it on the website because all, all of these, um, um, there are books. There's also articles on online that are written by experts, mm -hmm. written by folks that like me, that know the issue of asked the question yep. and write an article that's not heavy and deep. Yep. Um, it's written to be accessible to the layperson, you might say to yourself, well, they're not going to read an article that they, they just want a, a, a quick, quick yes. answer. Yes. If they are willing to read an article, you might send it to them, send the link, or you can say, well, they're not going to do that. They're just going to blow it off. And then you might read the article and see if you can say, okay, here are the salient points from the article. I've got it. I might not remember it. I might not ace a quiz on it, but I can get the main thrust and 
distill it and then go to your friend and say, this is what I found out. Um, I, I think I got it and, and just yeah. tell them. So I think there's a way of, there's digestible, accessible articles to answer a lot of these questions that you can either send directly or digest yourself and present. That's a, a quick answer. So, you know, Answers in Genesis, uh, Creation Ministries International Institute for Creation Research, and there are others, but those are the ones that are probably the most well-known. And then for the Intelligent Design um, Discovery Institute. But that's I, not going to be worldview. That's not going to be worldview. That's going to be more can we detect design that's good in nature what what i think is, has been helpful to me over time with this issue and, and others like the theology issues that you mentioned and other things i don't understand but believe <laughs> um part of that is i have researched i have studied i have read i just don't i just don't contain all of that information that i have read and studied and researched at my fingertips right it's right. not it's not right there um I had to come to the point in my life, I think, with some of this where I just took the pressure off of myself and said, it's okay to say what you just said. I don't know the answer to that. I do believe it, but there are a lot of resources. Let me find some of those and send them to you. And then trying to discern, are you just interested in arguing with me? Because if yeah. that's the case, then I don't need to feel bad about not being able to defend this. Yeah. Or are you sincerely interested? Because if you're sincerely interested, there are real resources I can point you to. That's good. That's a very good distinction to make because sometimes they're just doing a smoke screen and they right. want to get you embroiled in an academic discussion um, to keep you off of more personal matters like sin, righteousness, yes. judgment. <laughs> um, and it's very easy, especially if you're um, sort of an apologetic um monger that you you kind of there are certain christians that load up on on all of these answers and arguments and and um and they can be led because they like expressing yeah all of that and they're more interested in winning arguments than right. people right um right they can be led down that road easily um but it's, that's a great distinction to make. Find out if they're really, really earnestly wanting to know the answer and then, then and, and not just get one, they just want to argue. And I think the reason to me this, this uh, issue is, is so important beyond just the personal grounding in my own faith and confidence in what I believe and what the Bible says is because I do want to do everything for the glory of God. I do want to be a testimony of the gospel to others. And, you know, Romans talks about how creation leaves everyone without excuse. Right. How can we as Christians then leverage what we know about creation, what we understand about science, and some of the resources that you and others have developed? How can we use that to communicate the gospel to people who... Um, are probably not averse to faith because again if they're averse to faith they're not going to listen but they are not people of faith they're not christian people right. how do we use this body of evidence and science to communicate the gospel to others well that's one of the things that i i'd like to do with the the riot and the dance but that's mostly a christian audience and i'm trying to showcase god's glory and and often it's refreshing to the christians because they they may like to watch nature documentaries, right. but they're they're tired of the um, evolutionary narrative. Right. Right. And so I'm basically saying, let's give credit to whom credit is due, and 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 give God the glory. But to someone who doesn't, they've been convinced that all of this. They may love nature, but they've been convinced that all of this amazing creatures, and we have that all in the top. Uh, at the tip of our fingers looking at YouTubes of octopus and yeah. Yeah. some amazing creatures but they've been told ever since they were a kid that just enough time and uh, mutation and natural selection can generate all of this incredible co complexity and so one of my one of my goals is to 
um, really show the bankruptcy of that mm. sorry theory mm. um, and that and try to show that, you know, this thing that you love and I love, which is nature, whether it's trees or flowers or butterflies or dragonflies or elk, whatever, um, to show them the complexity is so, so beyond what this sorry theory claims. And that sometimes it doesn't need a biology degree to show them. It really doesn't. I think they just, so many people just believe what they're told yeah. and they don't think through it critically. And I think even without using just simple analogies of design, you know, like you said, Romans one twenty, God's invisible qualities, his yeah. eternal power and divine nature are clearly, clearly, Mm. not foggy, clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Yeah. So, um, so whether you talk about, I remember in high school talking to a, a friend who uh, didn't believe, and I was saying, well, if you're, if you're walking on the beach and you see this elaborate sandcastle, just beautifully crafted sandcastle, the kind that professionals do. And you look around, there's no one on the beach and you know that you didn't do it. The most logical um, uh, conclusion is that somebody with an, an amazing amount of skill crafted that sandcastle. Now, he would say, well, no, it's just sand and water. And there's plenty of that here on the beach. It can make itself. And it's like, no, um, <laughs> just because we can't see the maker doesn't, we can right. infer the maker. Same with, and sand, sand castles are static. They don't do anything, but um, you, you know, step it up a notch to cell phones and say, hmm. you know, everybody in their, everybody knows cell, cell phones were designed by a whole team of incredible engineers and incredible factories put it all together and cell cell phones are way less complex than a cell and yet we are told and we blindly accept that cells can happen through umpteen million years yeah. of chance and matter so you can appeal to common sense and say we know cell phones are manufactured and designed by very smart people and living organisms are vastly more complex and no amount of selection and time and whatever toolkit they say Darwinism has. But rather than think through it in a common sense way, they basically say, well, there's smart people out there with PhDs like Richard Dawkins that say otherwise. And I'm just, th yeah. rather than think through what's the common sense answer, they just go with the authority that says, oh, it can happen. Yep. Like, no, it can't. And <laughs> they're, 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 they're really no amount of time can fix it. Right. Um, because, and that's uh, one of your questions that I'd gotten earlier was, um, uh, what are some basic truths that anyone can hold on to that point to intelligent design? And those are the basic truths. That's one basic truth is that you cannot, when you look at something that requires, that is highly complex and highly specified, um, we one thing that everybody knows intuitively is that whatever that is, like a cell phone, requires lots of information, lots of data, lots mm. of architecture, lots of putting together highly specific parts that, and to me, it's a black box. I don't know anything about cell yeah, phones. Right. I know right. about cells, but not cell phones. Sure. <laughs> but I, I know one's more complex than the other. And 
we can just go information does this is one thing that we know information highly specified information does not come from unintelligent processes yep. and that we can know from our daily experience of anything we see around us we know certain things are not designed you know whether it's i mean we could say if it's matter it's designed ultimately as far as the matter you know the periodic table was designed by god but um if we just see a rock you know there's no specificity unless you're going into the atoms and molecules right, but there's right, there's right. it's not doing anything it's just you can explain right. a rock f by physical processes over time given matter but you cannot explain all sorts of man-made gadgets so that's that's one of the basic truths and the other basic truth which is basically the same thing so it's really one basic truth is that if even if you had one cell that can't happen by chance that microscopic mm -hmm. cell but then they'll say well if we have that one microscopic cell we can get all of the diversity of life right um from that through cell. natural right. selection but i said no this one cell is very very um to get from a bacteria to a baleen whale we need mm -hmm. to have a whole lot more information added um it's not just oh variation natural selection it's not just variation and selecting the fit and the uh it's it's adding it's it, this is one thing I tell my students over and over again. It's not just variation in the survival of the fittest. You have to add right. reams and reams of specified genetic instructions to go from bacteria to a butterfly mm. or a bat or broccoli or whatever right. um, to keep with the B alliteration there. <laughs> um, it's just information content going from no cell to cell. Yep. Information has to be there going from one cell to complex critters and plants. Lots more information has to be added. And mutation does not write. Mutation, which is just a mistake, yep. does not write complex genetic software. That's good. So that's the, I would say that's the basic <laughs> truth that you can have so many analogies uh, to it in the everyday life that just common sense. And just when you thought it couldn't get any better, Mike Lindell with MyPillow is launching the MyPillow 2.0. When Mike invented MyPillow, it had everything you could ever want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he discovered a new technology that makes it even better. The MyPillow 2.0 has the patented adjustable fill of the original MyPillow and now with a brand new fabric that is made with a temperature regulating thread. The MyPillow 2.0 is the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow you'll ever own. For our exclusive listeners, the MyPillow 2.0 is buy one, get one free offer with promo code SITREP. MyPillow 2.0 temperature regulating technology is 100% made in the USA and comes with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square to buy the one, get one free offer. Enter promo code SITREP or call 800-870-0283 to get your MyPillow 2.0 now. And that seems like a, an incredible starting point. So for me, looking at that, I would come to the conclusion, okay, I don't know what that intelligent design is, or I don't know where this came from, but that should start me on a journey of trying to figure it out. Right. I have a 13-year-old son who loves science and, and hearing, hearing the way you describe your childhood, he, he, he very much thinks that way. He loves it. He's very interested in it. And his favorite debate is the evolution versus creation debate. He's 13. Um, I mentioned he's homeschooled, so that means he mostly has it with us at the dinner table. Like he gets all worked up about this thing, right? Like uh, yeah. fighting, fighting these uh, <clears throat> these 
debaters that don't exist necessarily. Uh, but he puts together such clear arguments based on what he knows and what he's learned in school and what he's read. Uh-huh. Okay, so a 13-year-old can do that. You just laid out so many clear illustrations that should start anyone on a journey of discovery. Unless and yet they, we yeah. have... I was going to say, but we have the most brilliant people in the world, and they are. High IQs, spent their entire lives studying this, right. and they say it's not possible. What drives that? I, I don't believe it's science. <laughs> what is driving people like, like Dawkins and so many yeah, others? It's, a, it's, a, it's this entrenched um, uh, unbelief. I call it the mystery of unbelief because they're smart people. Yeah. They're smart people, no doubt about it. But the they've they've embraced stubbornly embraced this this um, they hate the idea of God. Right. They hate the idea right. of because God implies that well God might have opinions about my behavior and right right uh, if 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 I have a creator and all of life has a creator then this God must have a goal, a purpose. There, there must be, uh, mm. and they want to, they want to just expunge God from the picture completely. Right. And they'll go through all sorts of elaborate arguments to try to explain how life can happen. And it's just, I scratch my head and I go, this, I mean, I, I think he's way smarter, uh, but I'd be happy to debate Dawkins. I mean, I feel mm -hmm. like I'm, um, it's like a David and Goliath, but I'm like, <laughs> you know, this Goliath, he doesn't even have the Darwinist. They have fancy arguments, but we've got the sort of truth that can just, yeah. their, their yeah. arguments are like salami. And right. my sword of truth can just, they may be a better swordsman, but when they're brandishing a sausage. Sure, me, sure, sure. And, and I've got a steel sword. Yeah. I can take them out, you know. Yeah. Um, but you, you have to, and so I, and that's one of those things that when you've studied it, I don't think anybody necessarily can just do it. They might just say you're wrong and the Bible's right. Right, but uh, it the, the 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 they're really going on their authority, but the the data they've got is just um they're trying to build an argument against God, not against yeah, and and it's not to, a scientific to, argument, yeah, no, and and to to hold to life can happen from non-life and then life can evolve into all of these amazing things. There's just so much um, from the creation as well as the intelligent design community that can just yeah. bury it, just destroy yeah. it. But because they've got, um, they've got the, they've got the institutions of higher learning, they've got the mm. museums, they've got all of the programming, they've got the national parks. At yeah. every yeah. at every angle, they want to sort of brainwash society in which they've done a good job of, but even with all of their brainwashing, they still can't quite get rid of the notion of God in most, even right. your common Joe on the street. Right. Um, even a non-Christian, most of them, even if they sort of by default accept evolution, they just sort of go, well, yeah, God had to. I mean, <laughs> God's God, got to be in there somewhere. <laughs> God's in there somewhere. Yeah. And even when they do this, they've got a monopoly on all of the, um, all of the sources of information, public right. school, right. Uh, higher ed, everything. And yet they still can't squash completely the notion of God. There's mm. atheists are um, not a not a majority at all, yeah. even though they've got 
they've got the mic. Um, it, and, and bringing it back to you know the very first question of the conflict between faith and science, it really comes down to a conflict between faith and some scientists. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's not a it's not a conflict between God and science or faith and science. It's a conflict between faith and a faith. belief in God and and a belief that there is no God. Yeah, that's right. right. It's, it's it's two faith, faith systems faith. that are right. That's um, right. Yeah, and we can all say the same data. It's not like they've got their data. We've got ours right, right. there. We've, we have to deal with the same data and put it together in a way that makes the most sense. Um, yeah, so. man, there's so much, uh, there's so much here. And I, I think that Christians shy away from this again, because they just feel like, well, I don't have a good handle on it, but right. uh, this to me is not even about, communicating to people that they need to view God the way that I view God or to view even the human condition before God the way that I do. Or it really is about saying there is a starting point and the starting point is a creator. And if there's a creator, then we should probably, as responsible people, spend some time figuring out what that creator had in mind and what the design was, which then takes us to a look at the Bible and the veracity right. or truth of it and the historicity of it. And it should lead to an entire line of thinking that brings us to a place where we can then understand yeah. man's position before God. But to completely reject it outright, I agree. I think this is more about I don't want to be responsible to anyone. Right. <laughs> and so I'll build a system that says I don't have to. Right. Exactly. Well, I appreciate so much the work that you're doing on this. Um, I, I have, and you saw my questions. There are some others there. Maybe we can come back and do it again. But uh, this is so important and people need to be confident in what they believe. I'm thankful, honestly, for uh, the internet and YouTube and other resources that have made this much more accessible than it may have been at right. one time. But um, where would you point people to? You mentioned some sources. Um, you've written a book on this. Uh, you mentioned this, The Riot and the Dance. Um, there are good documentaries. Um, what are some resources you'd point people to? And then at the end of that, how can people follow you and the work that you're doing? Okay, so regarding what topic, there's the creation environmental debate uh, or and the Darwin environmental debate. Right. Um, yeah, so... Or Darwin, uh, Darwinism versus creation and then creation versus... Uh, or both. Or, yeah, maybe both. What are, some, what are some of your favorite resources that you would point people to that are generally interested in these topics that, you know, again, would be important to you? Okay, um, you know, if, I don't necessarily, if someone doesn't believe in God, I sometimes use more, and, and they're biologically astute, yep. well, I might send them to an intelligent design book mm. that really breaks down um, and, and approaches it from a scientific perspective that they really, so even though I'm not, um, uh, I'm not, some of these intelligent design books are old earth, but some of the arguments for the complexity of the cell, right, right, um, right. be he in Darwin's black box, um, I might send them. It really depends on the person and how, yeah. how uh, astute they are in, or educated in that particular area. I'm not going to give that book to someone who is wondering if there's a God and is sure, a, a sure. dropout or something like that. Sure. Um, and Stephen Meyer's books, even though he's older, if there are certain arguments there. If they're, um, if they're a Christian, well, you know, if they, they wonder about the, the veracity of young earth, I'll, I'll send them to, well, I'm going to be publishing a book on, Darwinism, mm. um, hopefully by end of the summer or fall, called Darwin's Sandcastle wow. um, and the Rising Tide. Um, and so that's going to be an overview of a lot of things from the, the authority of Scripture and uh, also looking at science, but lots of different topics. So, but that's not out yet. I also recommend uh, the new creationism by Paul Garner. Um, let's see. 
New Creationism by Paul Garner. Oh, very good. And that's a Young Earth um, book that covers the scriptures as well as astronomy, geology, and biology. Excellent. So my book is going to be different, but we'll hit some of the same of the some of the same topics. Um, and and again, I'd point them to those websites. Um, Answers in Genesis, or um, on the on the on the environmentalism side of things, um, I would point them to my book, um, uh, Different Shade of Green. Yes. So, and that just kind of gives a biblical approach to the whole question. That's good. Um, but there are other books out there that are Christian and um, give you uh, just a nice biblical worldview about how we should approach the whole, um, you know, how do we not throw the baby out with the bathwater with, with the um, with the environmental yep. movement? Because many Christians will either react. Uh, because of the environmentalist um, weirdness and, you know, tree hugging, Gaia worshiping, right. um, they'll <laughs> right. go, well, that's just really wrong and bad because they idolize nature. So the tendency for certain Christian conservatives is to th say, well, nature's an idol. We throw out right. nature right. and it's like, well, wait, no. Um, if we call it the environment, we somehow think it's their realm of their mm -hmm. jurisdiction. But if we call it the creation, same thing, but it gives us a different, um, say, oh, God made it. It's an idol to them. So their idolatry is wrong, not taking not, care of creation, right? Ta ta yeah. yeah, taking care of creation. And I think the other side of the boat is either you react against it because of the weirdness or you think oh it's cool to be green uh right. and therefore right. and then christians will start to um s start to drink the kool-aid of the environmental agenda which has got a lot of just wrong-headed thinking right not only from a creation standpoint but also from an economic standpoint sure. it's sure. just it's just ridiculous and so it's just, I try to steer a balanced view and say, hey, let's, it's God made it. He said it's very good. We therefore need to uh, take care of um, the biodiversity that he's made. And that requires us to rethink through things. So I That's can't. That's very good. I don't so want to. So for those, those that are listening and not watching, that is a different shade of green, a biblical approach to environmentalism and the dominion mandate. Um, that's awesome. Dr. Wilson, thank you for your time. Um, when your book comes out later in the year, um, I'd love to have you on and we can uh, walk through that together. Just so much great information and very powerful. I think this, um, again, grounds Christians in what they believe but then equips them to also communicate this to others and uh, very thankful for it. So thank you for your time and uh, thank you for the conversation. Thank you very much, Jeremy. It was great to chat. Many of our veterans feel they need to fight their battles alone. This self-isolation has led to the staggering statistic of more than 20 veterans taking their lives every day. The mission of Mighty Oaks is to eradicate the veteran suicide epidemic and help our warriors change their legacies. We've been able to help over 4,000 veterans and first responders by equipping them with the tools they need to live the lives they were created to live. Our faith-based peer-to-peer approach has one of the highest success rates of any program available today, offering hope and understanding to those who need it most. By aligning their lives to biblical principles, these men and women are able to lead their families, their communities, and our nation. It's your generosity that can make a difference in the lives of the men and women who have fought for our country and our freedoms. Now that they're home, don't let them fight alone. Learn more at MightyOaksPrograms.org. Grateful for Dr. Wilson and the work that he's doing. Um, 
Listen, as a person of faith, we are told all of the time that we need to keep our faith to ourselves and that anything related to God, it's a faith issue. It's, it, it has no evidence. There's no science. There's nothing real. Uh, it's just faith, and you're welcome to believe that, but don't try to tell other people that it's true. And I am very grateful for Dr. Wilson and, and many, many others, by the way, uh, real scientists who look at the evidence and come to conclusions and understand how God and creation and the uh, the ideology of uh, believing that there is an intelligent designer, that intelligent designer is God, how that works with science or science works with that. These things are not in conflict. We don't need to be afraid to talk about them. And if we don't fully understand the issues, that's okay. There are people who do. And for those who are sincerely seeking, we can help them find the answers Uh, Very, very grateful for this conversation, and I hope to have more like it in the future. Thank you for listening. I really do appreciate it. Please, if you're not yet subscribed, do that now. Subscribe, then you can go over to YouTube, find our YouTube channel, The Situation Report, and uh, we'd love to have you join us there as well, and look forward to talking to you next time.